Hey, we're Jeff and Jackie Lynch. We're part of the ministry team here at Compassion Church in beautiful Danville, Virginia. We are so glad that you have found us. Here's this week's message. Hey, happy Father's Day, y'all. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Hey, very good, very good. Good to see y'all out there, man. What an amazing time of worship this morning. Uh, sure do appreciate our band and our production team and everybody that it takes to make all of those things happen. As we get ready to go into the Word, can we just start with a word of prayer this morning? Just bow your heads, close your eyes, and just find a quiet spot in your heart right now. Take just a moment and let the, let the Spirit of God wash over you. Father, as we begin our time together this morning, we thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to raise your name, to proclaim your goodness. We thank you, Father, for an opportunity to come into your house and to invite you in to worship with us. Lord, as we begin this time of going into your word this morning, Lord, we have expressed our praise, our gratitude to you, our worship to you, and now, Lord, we just continue to invite you into our time, and we ask that through your word, that you will speak words of life to every heart here. God, you know exactly where every person is. More importantly, you know where you want to take each one of us. God, this is a house of miracles, and we're expecting you to do the miraculous in the lives of your people today. We invite you in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, excited to be back with you guys, man. I appreciate y'all allowing me an opportunity over this month of June. I've had a great uh, chance. Last week, I preached at my sister's church down in South Carolina. We've had a few, uh, few other folks coming in and speaking. I just appreciate you guys giving us a chance to kind of catch our breath in the month of June, but I want you to know how much I miss you when I'm not here, uh, both the folks in the house and our online community. Thank you guys who are online and joining in with us today. Um, Father's Day, very special day. All you dads today, <clears throat> I hope that you will have an awesome day. I hope that you find time to have some good food. Who's, who's going to be on the grill sometime today? Anybody going to be on the grill? Right? I see a few hands going up. Hope you have some good company. Hope you get a good nap today, but wait until you get home to start that. Come on. Don't, don't, don't start that yet. Right. So I want to talk to you today about a, a topic that, that certainly applies to dads, but it also applies to all of us. So, so this, this could be a Father's Day message, but it really is an everyday message. And so the title of our message today is simply, Be Great. Be Great. Um, I say that because I really do believe that, 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 I believe that God wants each and every one of us each and every one of us in our lives to pursue the greatness that he's built into us. How many of y'all believe that, that regardless of what you've done, regardless of what your experiences are, that God built greatness into you? Raise your hand if you believe that. He built that into you. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, yeah, maybe he built that into me, but I have not yet taken hold of that. Well, I want us to talk today. I want you to look at just a few stories from Scripture about some ideas of how you, no matter where you are, no matter what age you are, how you can go on this journey to be great. When we talk about being great, we're not talking about LeBron James or Steph Curry. Shout out, Warriors. Bradley's not here, big Celtics fan, so I can say that in this service, right? Um, not talking about Tom Brady. We're talking about the number one goat, the greatest of all time, Jesus himself the number one goat. And so here's the first thing. I'm going to give you three things this morning. We're going to go to three different stories, three main ideas or, or very simple applications that you can put into play for you to access what it needs to be great. Here's the first one. Greatness begins with humility. Greatness begins with humility. If you're taking notes, make sure you write that down. Now, um, did, you, did you ever have a kid in school, maybe you went to school with a kid whose mom was all up in his business about everything, right? Everything this kid did, mom had to get involved, and mom was putting a bumper on him, and mom was, was maybe protecting this kid from the teachers, and this kid never did anything wrong, and mom always wanted to elevate this kid. Well, Jesus had two guys with him that, that he chose. He knew this about them, but there were two of the guys that followed Jesus that were like this, mama's boys. And in this story we're going to, mama actually got involved, and she comes to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, 
When you come into your kingdom, will you let my boys sit beside you, one on the right hand and one on the left hand? Jesus is like, um, ma'am, I'm not sure you know what you're asking. I'm not sure you know what you're asking. She says, yeah, they're going to sit beside of me, and they're going to go through some of the things. But, but who sits at my right and my left? That's, that's not up to me. Well, as you can imagine, the other ten guys that Jesus was, was, was going through his world with, the other ten guys got a little wind of this that the two, James and John, had asked for this seat of honor. The Scripture says they were indignant when they found out about it. Um, let, let, let's go into the story. So, so Jesus um, has the conversation with the mom, and now he's talking with his disciples, and he sees this as a teachable moment. Look at Matthew chapter 20, 25 through 28. <clears throat> it says, but Jesus called them to him, his disciples. He called them to him, and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, when he says Gentiles, that's not the Jewish people. He, what he's basically saying is the culture, people that we're surrounded by, not followers of God, but just people in culture. The Gentiles, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. He's saying the common, everyday, lowly people have bosses, and the bosses exercise their authority over them. He said, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great, isn't that the title of our message, be great? Okay, all right. Whoever would be great among you must do this, be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Look at verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Y'all ever seen those scary ransom movies, right? Kid gets kidnapped. Uh, the, the, the guy calls up the dad, I got your kid, bring me a million dollars. What's the dad do? Dad's about to cut somebody, right? Dad is not having it. In our story, we're the kid. The enemy has stolen us from the father. Jesus steps into this world and he says, I have come and I will be the ransom to pay the price for you to be reconnected back to the father. He said, that's the reason I came. I am the king of the universe. All creation will declare my glory. All creation. Every head will bow. Every, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. But he didn't come here blowing his trumpet. He didn't come here blowing his trumpet. You know what Jesus said? He said, not so with you. They do things that way. They, uh, they, they demand that people worship them. They demand that people pay their taxes to them. You know what I came here to do? He said, I came here to serve you and to be a ransom for many. And he looked at his guys, his followers, and he said, not so with you. In a typical in a typical business environment, we call it the, the traditional pyramid where the CEO or the president is at the top and he has a group that, uh, of his leaders that, that they support him and then their volunteers support them and then the people at the bottom, all of the workers support the whole pyramid. Jesus says, we're flipping that pyramid upside down. Jesus says, I myself will be at the very bottom of the pyramid and I will support all of you. I'll serve you. I'll give my life for you. You want to be great? It starts with humility. It starts with humility. That's what he's called us to. To do that, to be a person who lives in humility, it starts with a decision. And that decision to humble yourself and put others before you, you know what that is? That's the gospel in action. We've been called to serve others. Now, let's go to the next thing. The first thing is that greatness will require humility. Here's the second thing. We're going to go to the, the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. Now, this gets a little bit, little bit flaky here. Hang out with me just a minute. I've got to explain some things. In this Old Testament book of, of 1 Kings, there's a, there's a guy, a prophet, and his name is Elijah. And Elijah is the man. God has, has poured his favor out on Elijah. And throughout the life of Elijah, if you just go through the Old Testament and count the miracles, right? Like if I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if I ask you to raise your hand, if you knew that God has done a miracle in your life, there would be a few of you say, yeah, I know God has done a miracle. If I said, how many of you have seen God do a couple of miracles? I don't know. Well, Elijah, in the course of his lifetime, what was recorded in the scripture was like 16 miracles that God did through him. Elijah, 
Um, one of those miracles in, included uh, Elijah going into this, this epic showdown with the prophets of Baal, false prophets. And they said, they said our, God is, our God Baal is real. And Elijah's like, yeah, whatever, that's not true. You, you worship some false god. Well, well, let's put this showdown together. We're going to sacrifice this animal and we'll, we'll create an altar. Elijah said, go ahead, do whatever you want to, right? If you read the story, it's hilarious, man. One of the funniest stories in the Old Testament because those, oh, those, those prophets of Baal, they spend all day day chanting and marching around this this altar that's been built where they slaughtered an animal and they put uh, an altar of wood and they're they're calling on Baal to come set the thing on fire and the premise of the whole thing is whoever's God is real is going to set the thing on fire well they do it all day long Elisha said he actually says in the scripture where is your God is he on break is he using the bathroom when's he coming it's hilarious Elijah trash talking the dudes man and then it's his turn and Elijah steps, Elijah steps into the moment, and he calls out to God, and God says to him, tell them to pour water on the thing, and then pour more water. And they pour water on this, on this altar until it's, it's piled up in a trough around the whole thing, and then whoosh, Elijah calls on God, and fire comes down from heaven, consumes the whole thing, and it consumes all of those prophets. Elijah did that thing. Well, that was Elijah's story, but, but God used Elijah to show his power. Elijah would soon call a young man to come and be his apprentice. Um, and this young man's name, this is where it gets a little weird. Elijah, the prophet, calls Elisha to be his successor, to be his apprentice. And so at the end of Elijah's life, when, when he's in, at the end of his life, Elisha asks him, he says, Elijah, I want to have a double portion of the favor that you have on you. Will, you. will you bless me with a double portion of what you have? Elijah said, that's not up to me to do that. God can do that. God chose to pour out that double portion of favor onto Elisha. Stick with me. We're going somewhere. I'll bring it around to the scripture in just a moment. And in the lifetime of Elisha, Elisha, the younger man, the one we're going to go into the scripture in just a minute, in his lifetime, he would eventually do twice as many miracles as what his predecessor did. Now, here's where I'm going, and I need you to hear this. Elisha would eventually do great things, but it didn't start there. It started with the decision that he had to make, and the decision that he had to make would lead him from a place of prominence to a place of a servant. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This, this was the key for Elisha. You will never step into what is next if you won't let go of what is holding you now. I'm going to say that again. You will never step into what is next if you won't let go of what is holding you now. That will make sense in just a minute. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Starting at verse 19, says, So he departed from there, talking about Elijah, the older, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Now, stop just a minute. Pause. Because we understand John Deere tractors, but we don't, we don't really get oxen, right? Well, an ox... Ox is a big animal, about one and a half times as big as a cow. And they would put two of them together, and they would put this farming implement on it. It's called a, called a yoke, and they would put the two of them together, and they would plow. When it says that, that he was plowing with, with 12 yoke of oxen, that's 24 behemoth animals out in the field. Huge field. They're running these John Deere oxen through this field, plowing this thing up. That's what he's doing. And he was with the twelve, and it says Elijah, the older, passed by him. He cast his cloak, his, his, his jacket. He threw it upon him, and he left the oxen, and he ran after Elijah, and he said, let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him, and he took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah, and he assisted him. And you have no way of understanding the, the importance of what it says when it says, then he went and he assisted him. It didn't say, then he went after Elijah and he became great. It said, then he went and he assisted him. Assisting means that I'm just going to be your servant. I'm going to be your slave. And in other places in Scripture, we see that Elisha would take on the menial task of simply pouring water onto Elijah's hands for years. 
What do you mean, Jeff? What do you make of all of this? Remember when I said to you a minute ago that you can't uh, step into what is next until you let go of what is now? If you want to be great, here's three things that, that it's going to take to be able to do this. If you're going to step into what's next, and I see this in Elisha, stepping into what is next will require, number one, a kiss. In verse 20, Elisha says, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. He says, let me kiss my father and my mother. See, in that culture, what that signified was, Elijah, you've called me into something. You've thrown your cloak over me, and I know you're calling me to what's next, and I'm coming, but let me do one thing. He goes back to his mother and father, and he kisses them on the cheek, and doing that in that culture signified I'm kissing goodbye to the thing that I've been living in, the thing that was before. I'm kissing goodbye, and I'm not coming back to this. This is the end of this season. He kissed them, and when he turned away, it's as if that thing in his life dissipated and disappeared. Can I ask you a question? If you're going to step into whatever the thing is that God has next for you, what is it that you need to kiss goodbye? What is it that you need to kiss goodbye? Do you need to kiss goodbye to your plan B? Do you have a plan B that says, if, if, if things don't work out, I can always fall back on this? See, Elijah, uh, Elisha had, had oxen. Uh, do, you need to, do you need to kiss goodbye to your safety net? Like, I know I can always back up to this thing. Do you need to kiss goodbye to your own personal plan? This is what I want to do with my life, and this is the way I've arranged everything, and this is the way I've aligned myself. What do you need to kiss goodbye to to step into what's next? You know, when I made the jump, and I've shared this story with you all several times before, but if you're new and you haven't heard this, I made the jump from, from working in manufacturing, management, um, in the textile world uh, years ago. And when I made that jump, I was faced with a very similar decision. I had to decide what I'm going to do. And I had to, I had to do everything that I'm seeing Elisha do here, just a different set of circumstances. No plan B. You know what my plan B had always been? Like I always knew that, that if something happens and I lose my job and that world people lose their job all the time, if something doesn't work out, at least I have this 401k sitting over here. Been investing in that since I started working. I've got this 401k. And But when God called me to leave industry and to leave manufacturing, to go into ministry, well, it went from being a significant annual salary and benefits and all of those things to, hey, you're stepping into ministry. Can I tell you something? God does not make it easy for you when he calls you into something. He does not make it easy. I had to take that 401k if there was going to be any way that my family could step into this thing of ministry, which was a huge unknown. I had not planned, prepared. God showed up. I wasn't ready for it, but I knew as, knew, as well as I knew my name, I knew he was calling me to that. I had to take that 401k, and with, with white knuckles, I had to let go of that thing, cash it out, give about 40% of it to Uncle Sam. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, ain't that something? And take the rest of it, pay off bills, and get ourselves situated to live off of very little. That was my plan B. I also had to look at where I had been for 15 years. 15 years of working with the same company, the same industry, 15 years of experience. And I had to leave that behind because guess what God was calling me to? He wasn't calling me to something that I had learned about, studied about, prepared for. He called me into a world that I had no experience in. I had no formal training. Yeah, I'd been in church most of my life, but I didn't know how to do ministry. I didn't know how to step into all of those things. I had no background in it. You know what God was saying to me in that? If you can do it on your own, you don't need me. There were so many times that I found myself kneeling on my, on my knees in that church, nobody there on a weekday saying, God, you've called me to this. If you don't make this work, this is going to be an epic disaster. I can't do this on my own. And he showed up every time. You know what else I had to let go of? I had to let go of my plan. Because my plan was to make money and to live a comfortable life and to have great experiences and do all of those things. And God said, that's a cute little plan you got there, Lynch. But I got something else. And can I tell you today that the plan that God has called me into has led me into adventure 
It's led me into places I never would have gone to meet people I never would have met. I thought what I had was a good thing, but good is the enemy of great. And God called me into something that I never could have imagined. And it's been the joy of my life to be your pastor and the pastor of everyone who's ever stepped into this church. I made that jump 17 years ago, and I've never regretted the decision. If you're going to step into what's next, it's going to require a kiss. It's also going to require a slaughter. Elisha had to slaughter something. Verse 21, it says, he took the yoke of oxen and he sacrificed them. See, this is interesting because the fact that, that Elisha slaughtered 12 pairs of oxen, 24 oxen, and all of the yoke that went along with them. You know what that tells me? It doesn't say this, but if you read into the text, Elisha slaughtered 24 huge behemoth oxen. Elisha was not working for someone. Because someone who works for someone would not take that man's 24 oxen and slaughter them. Now, let's contextualize this. Just use some round numbers. Um, you ever ride down the road and you see a field that's got a bunch of cows in it? Just, just look out the window and say every one of those is a $1,000 bill. All right? Those cow, each one of those cows, somewhere around $1,000. All right? Take that, take that concept. If you put that in today's math, and he's got 24 oxen out there, which are way more valuable than, than a cow, but this man took 24 oxen and slaughtered them. It, it, low, very low numbers. That's $24,000. And then you put on top of that the tools and the implements that went with it. Then you put on top of that everything that he was making off of them. He wasn't working for someone. He was the owner. And as the owner, he had a decision to make. I've got to get rid of those oxen. Why did he have to do that? Because he knew if I keep them around, it's always going to be in the back of my mind. I can hire them out. Someone else could work the oxen. I could still make money off of them. Yeah, that's not what God said. God said, you got to leave it all behind. you got to go all in with me. you got to trust me. There can be no backup plan. If you're going to be great, you got to let God be great through you. It's not going to be because of what you do. It's not going to be because you're so talented or because you're so dynamic or because you're so smart. It's going to be because of what God chooses to do in you. And Elisha was a farmer, and he, he was doing well with it. But God said, that season is over. Slaughter those oxen. What is it in your life right now? that is so valuable to you and so powerful to you and has such a hold on you that you cringe at the thought that I have to slaughter that thing in my life. Could it be that that's what's holding you back from what God wants to do? There has to be a kiss to step into what's next. There has to be a slaughter. And then there also has to be, there has to be a fire. There has to be a fire. In verse 21, it says he boiled their flesh with what? The yokes of the oxen. If you've ever seen an old picture of, of two oxen in the field plowing, these big behemoth animals are, are plowing in a field, and they have this, this tool on their neck. It's a, it's a wooden and iron piece that, that goes around their neck and connects the two oxen together so that when they plow a row, that the farmer can stay behind them and plow straight. Elisha had to, he had to take those, those yokes, as it's called, those tools, and he had to smash them and tear them apart, and he piled them up in a pile, and he burned every one of them. You know what those yokes represented? That's the tool that he used to make his money. And if he kept those, once again, it's calling back to him. As if he kept those, then there, there, there's a pull back to everything that he was familiar with, there was a pullback to everything that he was comfortable with. And I think God's saying to some people in here this morning, I want to take you into deeper waters. I want to take you to a place of greatness. But there has to be a kiss, there has to be a slaughter, and there has to be a fire. If you're going to be great, it's always going to require a sacrifice. And that's the last point. I want you to write that down. Greatness always requires a great sacrifice. If we go back to Jesus and the New Testament, maybe you've heard the story that, that we often refer to as the rich young ruler, the story of the rich young ruler. And a man walks up to Jesus and he says, he says to Jesus, and it's important that we notice how he says it. He says, what good deeds must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, first of all, I'm going to ask you right there, just stop. If you have the mindset 
that you have to do good deeds to inherit eternal life, you've missed the whole boat of the gospel. The gospel is all about what Jesus did to rescue us, not about what we do to earn the Father's favor. But this wasn't a, a, a time before, before Pentecost, and this was a time before uh, we had stepped into the New Testament. And in those days, they would honor God by living out the commandments. So he says, what good deeds must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And the man says, which ones? Go to Matthew 19, verses 17 through 22. And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. By the way, most of us in this room have already missed a boat. If that, if, if that, if that, that's not even ten commandments. We ain't even got the ten of them, and we've already messed up, which tells us our problem. Verse 19, he says, Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as well, or as, as yourself. Then verse 20, the young man said to him, I've done all of that. All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Ooh, you messed up then, brother. You done messed up. You should have taken what he gave you and left right there. What do I still lack? Verse 21, Jesus. And I can only imagine Jesus with those Jesus eyes looking into the heart of this man, past his eyeballs and down into his very soul. And he said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 22 says, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. What did the man want? The man wanted Jesus to give him a list. And when Jesus started giving him a list, he thought, huh, compared to your list, I'm doing all right. Truth of it is, he wasn't even doing well with the list, the partial list that Jesus gave him, but he had convinced himself that he was. He wanted a list. Jesus didn't want no part of no stinking list. You know what Jesus wanted? Jesus wanted that man's heart. Jesus wanted that man's life. Jesus wanted 100% of that man. You see, greatness will require a great sacrifice. And it's interesting to me that when Jesus looks into the eyeballs of this man, into his heart, into his spirit, and he says, sell everything you have, you are in treasure in heaven, go and then follow me, and the man walked away. It's interesting to me what happened next. Did you notice what happened next? Nothing. Nothing happened. Jesus said, here's what I'm going to require of you to be great you got to give me everything. I have to have your heart. I have to have your surrender. I have to have your life. I have to have you following me. The man walked away. What happened next? Nothing. Jesus didn't chase after that man. Jesus didn't let him get halfway around and say, okay, okay, wait, 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 come back, come back, come back. Okay, just sell some of it and come back. Sell 10% of it. Jesus didn't say sell 50%. Jesus told that man, Sell everything because everything is what's got you bound up. Everything that you own is your plan B. Everything that owns you, your wealth, has you in a place where you can't step into what I have for you. You're really, truly worshiping your wealth. You really have created an identity based on what you own. And Jesus says it has you in bondage. Jesus doesn't bargain with this man. He doesn't say, give me half of you. He doesn't say, give me Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then you do your thing the rest of the time. He says, come all in with me, and you're going to experience greatness in your life. I can't help but believe that there are some of you here today who have a sense in your life that, 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 that the life that you're living right now, your now, has a grip on you. And you know that God is calling you to what's next. You say, how do you know that, Jeff? Well, I don't think it was a mistake that a couple of nights ago, Jackie and I were at an event. We're leaving an event. A gentleman walks up to us as we're on the way out. He says, I need to tell you my testimony. Let me tell you my story. I didn't know this man. I'd never met him before. He said, my life up until recently, this is a man who's probably in his 60s, I would think, mid-60s. He said, up until recently, man, had a group of guys play golf with on Sunday mornings. We would drink, gamble, smoke weed. He said, when I wasn't with them, man, I'm cussing, watching porn. 
He said, God showed up to me one morning while I'm waiting on those guys. And he said, God spoke to my heart a specific word. I won't say what the word was. It was between him and God. He said, I know, God. I know, God. I know. He said, I, I felt, he said, I thought I was saved when I was just a kid. And I thought me and God were good. But God began that day, and he spoke one word. And he said, I kept messing around on that putting green, went and played golf with those guys. The next week, same place, God showed up and said the same word to him. And he said, I know. God, I want to get things right. I don't want to keep living the way I am. I know this doesn't honor you. And that thing got on that man. That man said he made his way to church. And he said that night at church, he walked up to the front. And he told that man that met him up at the front, he said, I've got to be saved today. I can't leave here and not be saved. And that man talked to him about placing his faith in Jesus, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that Jesus died on a cross and was resurrected on the third day, and believing that Jesus would forgive him of his sins. He said, I believe in all of that. I want that. And they prayed, and that man accepted Jesus. You know what he told me? He said, after all of those years and all of that mess, my life is different now. I don't struggle with those things now. He said, I'm not perfect, I'm not 100%, but I'm not the man that I was. You know what that is? That's being great. That's stepping into the life that God created him for. Greatness is not going to look like a parade down Main Street. Greatness is going to look like a person who's on their knees worshiping God, reading his word, filling your heart with him, and going out into this world and making a difference by loving on the people around you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I believe there's some folks in here this day that just like Wyatt have wandered away from God. I believe some of you right now have convinced yourself that you and God are good and you're not. You're not. That's not me being some, some condescending preacher looking into your life. That's me saying to you from a heart of love, that if you've convinced yourself that you said a prayer or walked down an aisle, but there's not been a change in your life, and if Jesus doesn't own you, if you've given him 10%, 50%, 90%, he's still waiting on you. My God is so patient. He loves you. He pursues you. And his version of greatness begins with laying it all down beginning relationship with him. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes right there? Father, there are some people in this room right now. Not my word, but your word. Your word is convicting hearts. Convicting those who know they've not given their life to you. They're not all in. Been holding back plan B and Lord I believe your word is convicting hearts right now but Lord I also believe that if they could see what you have planned for them in giving their life to you and stepping into following you that it would be trading pennies for thousand dollar bills God I pray right now that any person in this room that's under conviction that needs you, and like that man would say, I've got to be saved today. Pray for that ha to happen right now. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask every person in the room, stand to your feet right now. Just stand up, keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Nobody looking around. The Spirit of God is speaking to hearts and souls in this room right now. This is the day that the Lord has made, but this is also the day of salvation. And I'm just going to ask you right now, if you know that, that God is wearing you out right now and things just aren't right with you and you're desperately seeking to go all in with Him, He has come by this place today and He's saying to you, here's your opportunity. Will you walk with me? Will you follow me? If that's you right now, wherever you are, I want you to step out of your seat and make your way right up here to this front so that I can pray with you. If that's you right now, step out of your seat. Praise God. I thank you. Praise God. Come on. Come on. Who else? Come on up. God is saying to some folks today, it's time to go all in. Come on. Who else? He doesn't want 90%.
He doesn't want 50%. He wants all of you. Man, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. I've never done this before. If you grew up, man, could y'all just stop just a minute? And I need y'all to help me with this. I need the singers in the room to help me with this right now. I feel the Spirit of God leading me to say this to you right now. There's a song that we used to sing in the old church at a moment like this, and it's called Just As I Am. And I want us to sing that together. We don't need any music. We know it. Just As I Am. If you'll help me to sing that, there are some of you right now that just as you are, you need to pour everything you have right here at the feet of God. Would y'all help me to sing that? Just as I am without one plea. Who's going to step out right now? Who's been running from God so long and he's met you right here today? Father, I pray over this place right now that that those who are far from you will be so uncomfortable in this moment that they have to let go and put their feet to walking. We're not going to miss this moment, God. If he's calling to you, don't miss this moment. Everybody in the room right now, as you're singing, look to the person beside of you. Say, will you go if I go with you? Don't miss it. Look, everybody, look to the person beside of you. Will you go if I go with you? Somebody else is going to come down here if somebody will walk with them. They don't want to come along. Ask the person beside of you. Will you go if, you, if I come with you? Praise God. Who else? Come on. Will you go if I go with you? Keep singing. Keep singing. Keep singing. Keep singing. Will you go if I go with you? Come on. I wonder if I could have a few saints that would just come and stand right behind these who are kneeling right here and pray over them. If you just take a place right here behind them, you don't have to put your hands on their shoulders, just, just stand there in prayer. Could I have a few more saints that would just come on, on this side? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead these folks in a prayer in just a moment. We're asking God to do real business right now. Could I have a couple more folks on this side? We got some folks over here that don't have anybody standing behind them praying. Come on, somebody come on down. Come on. This is the church at work. Every one of you who are up here bowing down, praying right now, you have taken a step of faith, a step of, a step of courage to step out of your seat and to come forward and to give your life to Christ. What you're saying to Jesus right now is, I want, I want you to save me. God, I'm not asking for your favor. I'm not asking for your blessings. I'm laying my life at your feet. Every person who's praying right now, just say something along these lines to the Father. Say, God, I need you. I am placing my faith in the Son, in Jesus right now. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay the price for my sins. And on the third day, that you rose in resurrection. And you now intercede on my behalf to the Father. Jesus, I give you all of me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give you my life. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation that's come to this place. Father, we proclaim your favor right now. We proclaim your blessing. We proclaim that you are stepping into these lives, saving them, and that you're going to lead them on the journey forward. And we bless your name right now. Amen.